This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Um, this time I'm taking my Ambassador um, Juan Romero, and it's very clear that this event demonstrates how much El Salvador has changed, but it's also very clear that it demonstrates um, his leadership since he arrived to London to organize um, events that put Central America and El Salvador in the map. So, congratulations and thank you at the same time for the organization. Um, I would like also to thank um, the Institute for Hosting the event and, and Kevin for chairing It's a very special for me to be here, um, probably the last event I'm um, here back home um, for a change is um, as an institute, and there is a it moves as an institute, I don't know. I to enter into any of that debate. I want to enter in another debate which is very much about El Salvador. I feel very intimidated to do it in the presence of real Salvadorian experts. I, um, I'm not one of them, um, but I will try to make sense of the economic experience. I feel also a little ashamed that I have never gone to El Salvador and I'm trying to convince um, the ambassador to solve that problem. But I continue trying to do it as we go along. Let me start with three um, quotes that I think demonstrate a little what the debate about El Salvador from, if you want a more mainstream uh, position in economics, but from different perspectives. Um, and this, this, the first is from Fusades, which um, all of you know is the um, think tank uh, connected to the modernizing elite which wrote a report in 2009 um, discussing um, the uh, time in the peace accords in which actually it argues that El Salvador is A, very different, but also had done reforms that are, were extremely important and despite the challenges uh, placed El Salvador in a very different perspective. <clears throat> the second is from two people that probably have only gone to El Salvador once. They are um, two well-known economists but that I think have identified what is one of the problems in economic terms, um, which is a very much lack of incentives that the elite has today to invest in profitable activities that um, create um, employment. And it's so, and I want to pick that up at the end very much because they are making a lot of money in um, the uh, circulation activities, as um, Jenny was saying, and that's probably one of the key problems in El Salvador. So there we have that um, markets, that one could say also, um, the whole structure is not necessarily good at facilitating the kind of transformation that will lead to real employment uh, and real employment opportunities. The last one is not really a quote, but it's um, a, a comic um, in which you can read, well, you probably cannot read, but uh, I agree, yes, and it says, first it came um, the idea, which I'm not sure how that fit in. Uh, thank you. Then came the coffee, then in the industry and the prostitution, then maquilas. But uh, so we have models that come and go, but um, the poor continue the same. Um, and the other person says, maybe it is time to think a little more about people's welfare. And we have then the, the three positions about um, El Salvador, and probably the three are them, uh, are right in that El Salvador was. If you take it from a very neoliberal perspective, a huge uh, reformer, and that has been very successful, but um, that had not led to a very different economic structure in any way, and as a result, we have that uh, people's lives in uh, many ways have um, remained the same. So I want to spend the last, uh, the next 16, 17 minutes precisely answer those questions. How do we think about the evaluation of the uh, 20, uh, last 20 years, but also uh, we have to be um, here in 20 years' time. Um, how do we think about what are the things that El Salvador should be doing to remedy and to um, create uh, a new economic structure? To do so, let me think about four different questions. The first is where is that El Salvador came from? Why it is um, that the previous model resulted in a civil war, um, although um, Jamie put it in a much um, nicer personal but also political terms that I can um, ever try to do. The second is what is the nature of the model, the outcome, and I think the big challenge is that we need to think about and that I hope we think about in the 
um, discussion. Here you have, from a user's work, a, a comparison of what uh, is the type of state society relations that uh, El Salvador, as compared to two countries that were more on, of Costa Rica and the Dominican Republic, which in many ways were more successful, had a very general analytical term before the 1980s. And the, the, the difference is that while especially Costa Rica uh, was able to develop a relatively broad coalition in which the middle class had a very significant political role, in El Salvador, even during the post-institution, we have the, the remains of the coalition between the army and the agriculture oligarchy, which created very little space, not just for the uh, um, poor, not just for peasants, but also for uh, some of the, of the modernizing elites. The situation um, was rather dramatic because A, economic growth was low, although higher than in previous periods, 2% uh, per year between 1960 and 1979, but social spending, and here is a dramatic thing, while uh, um, was around 15% by 1980 in uh, Costa Rica, it remained around 5% of GDP in the case of El Salvador. Moreover, it was very much a type of truncated modernization of the country experience. So, in the 1970s, and again, I'm not just trying to give you numbers, but sometimes numbers illustrate very well, we have that despite a very significant process of modernization, around 50% of all people in the working uh, age were unemployed, and 10% more, sorry, 10% were um, unemployed, and 50% were uh, underemployed. So, 60 of every 100 people that were in um, working age actually didn't have an uh, adequate um, way of living. So it's not um, surprising under this structure that um, a, a civil war, a, a revolution would emerge. It, you had a structure in which a whole process of modernization had created supposed opportunities that never materialized. Not just for um, the poor, but in some senses also for the urban middle class. And um, although, um, again, um, Jim is very much better, the, the civil war very much had uh, obviously democratic uh, roots and the roots that connect to Egypt, etc., but it had also very much roots around the weakness of a process of modernization that was never able to create opportunities. The civil war was dramatic in personal terms. It was dramatic, obviously, for the um, thousands of people that died. It was dramatic for part of the church um, that was assassinated, including, as you know, Monsignor Romero, who uh, one of the centers will become saint. Um, but uh, it was very much also painful in economic terms. So between 1979 and 1989, the GDP um, diminished by quarter, um, and uh, minimum wages uh, were reduced by 50%. So if you want a um, country in which the 1980s was the lost decade, that was in Salvador. And that is very much the context in which um, the uh, process of neoliberalization of the 1990s and 2000s yeah, took place. So what happened then? Um, I think, as um, both of the previous speakers discussed, um, the dramatic process in El Salvador, which is not unique to El Salvador, is very much a Guatemalan experience. One could argue that it's also very much part of the Spanish transition in a very different way. It is that as um, those involved in the war uh, were discussing and trying to get new political rights, they saw a, an economy that was being transformed in a direction that probably was very much at um, their disadvantage. What was the, the structural basis of that? Um, well, the first was um, an economy that is increasingly based um, the mouse up here, yeah. uh, very much uh, based on remittances and machinas. What you have here is in um, white or imports, then in red um, exports and uh, in blue maquilas and remittances. And what is extraordinary when you think about the economy um, is that actually maquilas for the last few years are almost equivalent to exports. 
So um, something that you might have heard, um, uh, but is very clear in El Salvador, the main export of El Salvador is people. It's actually not goods and services. And this, we can argue um, conditions, and I want to go over that in a second, conditions very much the whole structure of the economy, but also much of the policy and economic policy that is being um, made in um, El Salvador. The second is that, very similarly to the rest of Central America, what you can see is a very significant expansion of the current account deficit. Basically, El Salvador exports um, people, gets remittances, and um, uses those remittances to buy huge amounts of imports, mainly and increasingly from China. If that's the case, um, you will not be surprised that the internal face or the internal uh, part of the uh, mirror is obviously an um, increase in the service economy and uh, a very um, significant inability to develop a vibrant agricultural sector. And I think that's um, one of the big challenges uh, for the country. So as the agricultural sector has been modernized, it has lost space in GDP, but it has also lost space in creating survival strategies for many people in the rural sector. And the last one um, is um, the consolidation of a new state which is very much around neoliberal principles. So um, ARENA um, had a very modernizing agenda, which very, was very much probably the prototypical of the Washington Consensus. And there we have you not know, just the process of dollarization to try to control inflation, but processes of privatization, increasing targeting of social spending, etc., etc. And um, if you think about how Jamie finished, it's very much about redefining what a, a, to the move from a neoliberal state to an state that is able to do things, one of the big challenges of the current reformist administration. But in many ways, to retake the, pro, uh, the previous uh, element, more than any other Central American country, El Salvador represents the example of a remittance migrant economy. You have there the uh, remittances as percentage of GDP, although um, this is always a rather um, difficult measure um, to do in all the countries, including El Salvador, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua. As you can see, um, by 2008, almost 80% of GDP came from remittances. This was slightly less than Honduras, Honduras, but in many ways, given the rest of the structure of the economy, it was more than Honduras. Why? Because the combination of having a dollarized economy, huge amount of remittances, uh, an elite that is very good at producing construction and other services, and a financial sector that is rather developed, means that basically the interest of the economy is about getting those remittances and redistributing around the rest of um, the economy. And this means also that politically, much of the incentive is precisely around trying to maintain these remittances. A, because they are a key instrument to maintain social peace, but also to uh, secure the uh, macroeconomic stability. And this, again, creates very negative incentives when you think about policy. So the model was very much clearly the attempt to adopt the Washington Consensus which in the specific case of El Salvador led to a remittance financial economy. What about the results? Well, let me start actually with some lines, because otherwise um, we're is going to uh, regret having organized this event uh, for any or another. The first is that, although as you saw before, it's, uh, the amount, the reduction of inequality of poverty is contentious, and especially very much depends on the moment you take, uh, whether it's the 1970s, and the period after the war, it's very clear that if one thinks about the early 1990s, after the lost decade, poverty has gone down at least um, slightly. So, according to the UNDP, uh, poverty has gone from 53% in 1995 to 35% in 2005, although, as more said, it has increased recently very significantly because of the financial crisis. Um, and this has more to do um, with remittances, but more recently has to do with some exciting initiatives in terms of social policy. 
So the other key component of the Fulis administration, what is the reform of the state, is whether it's able to consolidate some of the reforms that it has started in issues like health or the non-contributory pensions, which are extremely important in a country where social spending has been either very small or very concentrated on targeting during the Reagan administration. The second is the expansion and diversification of exports um, based pr primarily in the expansion of remittances. And the third, and probably more um, actually important in the Central American context, is that the tax burden has increased more than in some other um, countries. And again, it connects to um, Jenny's comments about El Salvador having still a state as compared to Guatemala that probably doesn't, slowly doesn't have any. So actually, ta um, taxes, even if in a very unequal way, have increased 40% um, in, um, the, since the uh, mid to the 1990s to the mid 2000s. And more excitingly, in 2012, El Salvador passed a reform that for the first time increases income taxes for people that makes over 150,000 US dollars. Um, so it's a, a significant first step into the direction of changing the uh, tax system. What are, however, the negatives? Um, the first two um, are A, very low levels of economic growth a, and um, very low levels of investment. El Salvador invests only, only around 12% of GDP. And this very much connects to um, Jenny's comments about the circulation economy. There's simply no incentives to create new factors, new, new economic activities uh, that are important. Let me just show you, um, although I'm conscious of the time, um, some of um, these. Um, the first is how this is economic growth every five years, and as you can see, um, things were relatively good after um, in, in the early 1990s because the visa force was coming, some capital came into the country, but have deteriorated increasingly. So that by um, the last few years, with the economic crisis, um, El Salvador was only growing at 1% um, of GDP per capita. And of course, as some of us discussed yesterday as well, um, growth is probably, I mean, it's obviously not a sufficient condition to solve El Salvador problems, but it's most likely a necessary one. And part of the problem is the economy is not creating those jobs. Um, the second is that um, the maquilas were not um, the best system to create the economy, not only because they depend on low wages, etc., but because they were totally unable to compete with China. Um, what you have here is the, the share of this country that I'm going to show, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, all the way to El Salvador, the share of um, their exports to the U.S. in the total imports that the U.S. does of apparel. And what you have is that Costa Rica and the Dominican Republic were leaders, but as you can see, they, by the late 1980s, uh, their exports went um, to the U.S. went down, uh, Guatemala the same, and, uh, sorry, Guatemala, and then um, you have um, El Salvador is the next one. And as you can see, by 2007, even if it's increasing a little, maquilas are becoming relatively unimportant in to, uh, the uh, US. And that's because even despite low wages, Chinese competition is just too hard to maintain. And because the, the government has been totally unable and unwilling to try to develop from maquilas other activities and other sectors that can be more dynamic. So, um, and the last one, and the most important one, is of course the total inability to create jobs. Um, I told you that in the 1970s, uh, underemployment and, um, uh, uh, was around 50%. Today, it's around 35% of all the working population. Um, together, we add that to other types of informality, it means that more than 50% of people working don't have other great jobs. So, um, I probably have one minute time. I have time, so let me uh, talk about the future a little bit. What is that El Salvador needs to do? I think, yes, yes, I, I, I realize that it's not uh, time to continue talking, but I'm trying to stop. Um, only to say, 
um, that I think is very much about uh, recuperating the social agenda, about thinking about how you are going to modernize the rural sector, but that the two big question marks, are, and the ones I want to give you with, is where the incentives for that are going to happen. How do we create a new state, but also how do we engage with the large family business groups, which are important and will continue to be important in the future. It's something that I hope we can discuss now in questions and answers, because it is these two things will be the difference between being here 20 years from now, saying exactly the same things as today, or saying something more optimistic about a new Salvador that is able to create welfare in a much more sustainable way. Thank you very much.